All right, today's interview is with Shannon Detweiler. She is a practicing genetic counselor and she has some really great tips in there. Uh, some new stuff that I've actually never heard, some good pieces of advice, and she's just been a wealth of knowledge on everything genetic counseling, especially um, working towards it as a coming applicant. So I hope you enjoy this really awesome interview with Shannon. All right. Okay. So just to start off, would you mind introducing yourself and your educational background? Yeah. So my name is Shannon Detweiler. Um, I got my uh, Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from Indiana University of Pennsylvania in 2012. Um, and then I ended up taking two years off to work, um, which is an alternate way of saying I didn't get into grad school my first try. Uh, and then I uh, got my master's degree from the University of Michigan in 2016 in genetic counseling specifically. Awesome. Did you, so you took two years off. Did you apply each of those years or did you just take, apply out of undergrad, <laughs> wait two years and then do it again? Um, I would have applied in the interim. Um, what ended up happening in brief is that I ended up working in a lab for the University of Pittsburgh. And when I was hired, my boss said, I'd really like for you to work for me for two years, basically so I can train you and then get some use out of you. Um, and I had just gotten married. My husband was still like going to IEP. And I thought, you know, two years won't be so bad. Um, and then about 10 months after she hired me, she said, um, I'm really sick of applying for funding and I'm closing down the lab. And <laughs> I'll help you find a new job. It's going to be okay. Um, but I had just missed the deadline to reapply. Um, cause I, I thought that I had committed to two years with her lab. So I would have, um, but circumstances just didn't line up that way. I, I will say that, um, I don't think I was a much better candidate after one year and after two years, I, I obviously was. So. Okay. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a really unfortunate circumstance of just bad timing, but <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'm curious what you did in that interim in terms of, fortifying your application for the next cycle? Yeah, um, so I think I, I say this as a person who has reviewed applications um, for programs before. It is very common for people to midway through their undergraduate career realize that they want to be a genetic counselor. And those people are often, and, and I include myself in this group, um, are kind of scrambling to get enough experience um, and finish their degree. And those are the people that typically like some postgraduate experience is going to help them out. So coming out of undergrad, um, I had a good GPA. I had gotten some relevant volunteer experience, but there wasn't a lot available in Indiana at the time. So I had some grief counseling experience. Um, there were really no crisis counseling options that were compatible with my schedule as a student. So I had... Um, I had volunteered with a grief support group at a local funeral home, and I was part of a really excellent program called Hopeful Hearts. Um, so I was a grief counselor for 11 to 14 year olds, um, but that was it. That was really all I had. Um, I did not have a lot of research experience and I didn't have any um, really directly applicable crisis counseling experience. So working in a lab um, for two years. So I started out working with Drosophila in developmental biology. And then I transitioned to work with mice in a neurobiology lab. Um, so building up that experience and using a lot of um, genetics as part of the bench work that I did was really helpful. Um, and it gave me a real advantage when I went to graduate school because I had a much stronger molecular biology background than um, people who hadn't had that lab experience. And I also volunteered in a couple different capacities. Um, so I got involved with Pittsburgh Action Against Rape and I trained as a, um, I had two roles. And I think at the time I was the only person who did both things. Um, so I was a hotline volunteer where I would take a shift once or twice a month to be on their call-in hotline. And I was also a medical advocate, which meant that I would again, have another shift where I would get a call and then I would go to a local emergency room for someone who was having like a sexual assault examination. And I would sit with them and be a source of support and also let them know that there were resources available through PAR afterward. Um, and I also volunteered with um, Buddy Up for Down Syndrome, which was um, a volunteer like adaptive tennis group for 
kids with Down syndrome um, that was run out of Monroeville. Um, and I did a couple miscellaneous things. Um, like I, I volunteered at a um, the Albert Einstein Center. There was like a Jewish genetic screening thing that I participated in once, but those were like the consistent things that I um, did over time that I think made me a much better applicant. I also just matured a lot. Like I, I got married, mm -hmm. I was less anxious after having a real job and getting some just practical life experience. So. That's great. It sounds like you did a ton to fill that up a little bit after <laughs> yeah. undergrad. Yeah. That's great. So I'm curious what specialization you, um, how you ended up finding your way into your specialization that you ended up choosing. It was a process. Um, so I started out thinking that I was really interested in prenatal genetics. I guess as this relates to as an answer to my prior to the prior question you asked as well. Um, I read pretty much nothing but like memoirs of people who had genetic conditions for like the two years that in between I um, like undergrad and grad school. And as a side tip, I also like just get the guide to genetic counseling and read it, the textbook that everybody uses. That's a really good thing. Um, but I had read all of these books um, and I found myself being like most drawn to the idea of prenatal testing. And there was a, this book called, um, I'm gonna have to look it up. The author's name was Raina Rapp. And it was essentially a book that talked about how um, like prenatal screening changed the entire experience of pregnancy. She wrote a couple books. One of them is called The Tentative Pregnancy, but there's another one that, that I was really interested in that I just can't remember the name of. Um, but it was all about how prior to the ability to do prenatal testing, um, you just had a baby and you had no idea what happened. And then when you became able to find out whether or not a child had a genetic condition and whether or not you wanted to continue that pregnancy or like know ahead of time that you were going to have a child that was different from what you expected. Like philosophically, that was really interesting to me. And then I happened to go through in graduate school, my rotations in kind of the order of the life cycle. So I did prenatal first, then pediatric, then cancer. Um, and it turned out that when it came to real world experience that I was not at all interested in prenatal, <laughs> that intellectually it was really interesting for me, um, but just talking to very anxious pregnant women was not my cup of tea. Um, mm -hmm. And what ended up drawing me to cancer specifically was um, just realizing how powerful screening and prevention can be. So I have massive amounts of respect for prenatal and pediatric counselors. Um, but in those scenarios, if you have a pregnancy that has a genetic condition, there's nothing that can be done about it. There is value in educating people. This is what your child is going to be like. Here's your risk to have another child with this condition and to letting you know their options, but you can't fix it. And if you have a child who has a condition and is being seen in pre pediatric genetics, hopefully you can help them. Um, same types of things. You might be able to ameliorate some symptoms. You might be able to do some prevention of worsening symptoms. Um, you can inform the parents' risk for another child, but it really came to cancer genetics and thinking about how you can have an unaffected person and you can find out that they have these risks for cancer and for many cancers, not all cancers, but for many, we have good either screening, early detection or prevention methods that can really prevent anything from happening to you. Um, some cancers like ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer, we're not good at screening for or preventing. Um, but it was just kind of seeing the impact that it could have on families that really drew me to that. And I, I thought that I didn't like cancer. It was the opposite. When, when I had my cancer class and I was reading about it in this dry textbook sort of way, I was so uninterested in it. And it was when I actually interacted with patients that I thought, oh, this is where it's at. This is my thing. It's really funny how those they can kind of switch what you initially yeah. think. <laughs> and that is pretty funny. Well, what, do you specialize in a certain kind of cancer or is it just a lot of different cases will come to you? Yes and no. So um, I started out the first year after I graduated, I worked for the cancer genetics program at the University of Michigan, or I guess it's called Michigan Medicine now. Um, and we they were split into the breast ovary group and the everything else group. And the everything else group focused on colon, endocrine, and dermatologic uh, primarily. So I worked in the everything else group. 
And then I ended up um, coming back to Pittsburgh. And here it's flip-flopped where we have a gastrointestinal group and then we have an everything else group that's mainly breast ovary and I work in that group. So I see a lot of personal and family history of breast ovary now, but we do see other things like prostate, um, you know, kidney, melanoma, you name it. Okay, interesting. So I'm curious what a typical day would look like for you uh, if, if that exists, if it's not like too <laughs> variable. No, I, I have two types of days, I would say. So I have um, like administrative days and those are days where I primarily prepare to see patients and also follow up on patients that I've seen before. So I will, if I have an upcoming patient, I'll take a look at their chart. Um, I'll write up a history of um, whether or not they've had cancer, what type, what treatment, some reproductive questions and screening questions. Um, I'm fortunate to have assistants and students who work with me. So um, I often don't have to get the pedigree or family tree ahead of time by myself. Um, try to get test reports for other relatives, try to get records if records are missing. Um, and for every patient, once we have all that information, you come up with a plan for what you'll do when you see them. Do they qualify for testing or not? If so, what testing? Um, will their insurance cover it? How much will it be if it's not covered? Um, and then we review all of those cases at a weekly case conference. So we get a consensus on the plans, um, for, especially for complicated patients. Um, I also spend those days like calling out results, um, writing progress notes for patients that I've seen whose test is pending, uh, writing results letters for patients who have results in, um, and doing things with students. So um, like reviewing cases with students, um, talking to them about, you know, uh, making progress in becoming a genetic counselor and going through their rotation. And I also am involved in a couple of different research projects that I work on. Um, okay, so that's sorry, really that's, I paused and that was the first type of day. I didn't tell you about the second. But, oh yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, then there are days where I see patients, which are, that tends to be all I do that day. Um, and it's just seeing the patient, counseling them, taking them for a blood draw. Um, nowadays we do video visits. Um, and sometimes that involves like coordinating a saliva care blood draw as well. So there's a much shorter answer to the second type of day. Okay. So, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the virtual visits that I'm yeah. sure have, have been a lot more prevalent since the pandemic started. Like, how has that affected your day to day, especially when it's such a sensitive kind of career that you have yeah. to deal with? I mostly think it's great. Um, so here's like pros and cons of video visits. The pros are that it, um, for a lot of patients, increases access. So um, I think that uh, when you have patients that have like young children who have school or maybe are sick or just are having a bad day, I have people show up to visits that wouldn't otherwise, that would cancel. People who live really far away that just don't wanna drive into Pittsburgh or don't even wanna drive to some of our satellite clinics. Um, the cons are that I think that it is sometimes difficult for patients who are elderly or low income. So not everyone has a smartphone or a laptop or knows how to set that up. Um, a lot of those people have like kids that are willing to help them, but still it's, it's something of a barrier to care. I, I think that those that people, um, that some people have trouble coming for an in-person visit for those same reasons. If your health is poor or if you're older or if you don't have a car, like maybe you weren't going to come to your in-person visit and who knows if the barrier is lowered a little bit by the video visit. Um, even before COVID, we had done telemedicine. The main difference was that we had satellite clinics at places like Johnstown, um, Erie and Altoona. There's a couple others but um, the patient would still come into the hospital there and they would be often with a nurse who would like have a computer on the other end um, and we would just kind of do a secure Skype session and the nurse would help consent them and take them for the blood draw. Whereas now when we do video visits with COVID, it's me wherever I am, the patient in their home, and then we have to coordinate the sample later. Um, okay. So it's, I wasn't totally new to video counseling. It is a little harder to pick up on emotional cues sometimes, um, but it's, it's gotten easier. Um, we do have ways to get people visual aids ahead of time. Um, I've also just kind of like learned how to adapt and do more verbal counseling. Um, I will say there are some patients too that just, 
uh, most patients are respectful. They treat it like a regular appointment and they find a nice quiet place to sit. Um, but some patients are going through the McDonald's drive through and taking a bath or working on their car. And um, I don't, I feel like that limits the amount of information that's being shared, but I lack control over that. So yeah, yeah, it's mostly a good thing in my opinion. That's good. I mean, it seems like on the surface, it might seem limiting, but if nothing else, the accessibility seems like a huge thing that might stick around too. Yeah, yeah. I don't, um, I don't know if people have mentioned this too in other interviews, but um, genetic counselors are not CMS recognized providers. So CMS being like Medicare and Medicaid. So um, mm. that was part of why we couldn't do video visits in the past. It was something that was reserved for doctors. And then COVID resulted in an emergency declaration that allowed um, not just internet counselors, but other um, like non-physician healthcare providers to be able to use that service. And even pre-COVID, there's been a lot of effort by genetic counselors to become recognized providers, which hopefully would eliminate that barrier for good. But it's um, my uh, peripheral understanding from watching the updates is that it's just, it's just been a struggle to get that bill to pass. Okay, I did not know that. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's something that would probably be coming in the next few years or as, as it's growing? Yeah, it's been in process for a long time. Um, I wish I could tell you exactly when those efforts got started. Mm -hmm. It's been ongoing at least um, since 2014 when I was a student, probably before that. Um, I am not terribly well-versed in what the challenges have been in the fact that it's taken so long. Um, but my hope is that maybe there will finally be data from COVID that shows that video visits are a good thing and that that can be um, part of the argument that's made um, that genetic counselors should have that recognition. So there are a lot of people more knowledgeable than me and a lot more active in, in lobbying and the political parts of things than me. Um, and I, if you just, if you Google like um, genetic counseling, CMS bill, um, it'll come up. It's like HR 1040 or something. Again, not remembering exactly, but there's a lot of information out there about it. Okay. Yeah. That definitely seems to be reasonable that the data from trying this out right now would certainly <laughs> help you guys out. So that, that'd be great. Yeah. I think there's probably all kinds of issues because they had so much trouble even pre-COVID but who knows, it can't hurt to be able to show that video visits help people. So. Yeah, absolutely. So the next thing I'm wondering is what your favorite part of being a genetic counselor is. Yeah, I love how often I get to give people good news. Um, so it varies by cancer type, but roughly 90 to 95% of the time, there's no single gene hereditary cause for why a person develops cancer. So um, a lot of times when I am calling out results to people, I'm getting to tell them that there is no identified mutation. Um, and I've, I'm at the point in my career now where, you know, when I look at a family tree, I can often make a pretty good prediction about what the outcome is going to be. And it's, it's not surprising to me when I get a negative result back, but for some people, they don't have the experience that I have of looking at hundreds and hundreds of families and hundreds of results and having a reasonable level of confidence that it's going to be okay. And they've lived with this happening in their family and people that they knew and loved. And it was really scary to them to think that there might be a genetic cause. So it's really, um, it's a nice experience to get to call out a result to someone and to hear them be relieved. And having a negative genetic result or no mutations, it doesn't mean that you'll never develop cancer. But it means that your risk is lower. It means that we think carefully about whether or not you might still qualify for some extra screening, even in the absence of a genetic condition, um, and that you're going to be followed a little bit more closely than the average population. But it's sort of, you've given a new anchor point for what your risk is. Maybe it's still higher than the general population, but it's not as high as if it would have been genetic. And some people just, you know, if you see it happen to your mom, your sister, your aunt, you're really worried that it's something that is 100% chance for you. And instead of learning that the risk is moderate rather than 100%, it can be really relieving for people. So I, I love making those calls and just being reminded that even though it's routine to me to be like, oh yes, this is gonna be negative, 
it's really a relief and good news for people. I had a really good time calling out results before a long holiday weekend today in particular, just like giving good news and then knowing that people are going to go talk with their families over the 4th of July. That's so great. That's definitely, I, I didn't really realize that. I mean, like you said, you, people don't realize that, and you, but you do because you've seen so many different cases, mm -hmm. but that is really nice. Cause I mean, if you, I guess when you learn about what the field entails, you will reason that there are some tough conversations to be had, but to think that a lot of them are actually positive and you can teach people about what is going on, but then in a reassuring way that for right now, they, you know, they're okay and everything else. That's, that's really great. Yeah. And even when I have to give like bad news and say mm -hmm. there is a genetic cause for why this happened. Um, most of the time we are able to link people up to either an appropriate doctor or a high risk gaming program and to be able to say, yes, you have this significantly increased risk. Here's what we can do to help reduce that risk. So it's, um, it, it can't be bad news, but it's also news to use. And especially if I'm talking with someone who is young and unaffected, and we've found out that they have an increased risk before anything happens to them, um, you know, it's, it's not a call that I like to make, but um, in the long run, you hope that it helps prevent something from ever happening to them in the way that perhaps things happened to their relatives in the past and you just weren't able to detect it. Um, and then there, even when people have cancer, sometimes knowing that you have a genetic mutation can help plan your course of treatment. Um, and help improve your outcome, or you know, you can kind of bundle together the treatment for your current cancer to help prevent another cancer. So I see, I just got off of a week of being on call, which means that I'm seeing urgent newly diagnosed patients, the majority of whom have breast cancer. Um, and many women are referred to genetics if they meet the criteria for testing before they schedule their surgery, because um, if they find out that they have a mutation in a high risk gene, so a gene that has a definite risk for a second breast cancer, they might consider either having a bilateral mastectomy to treat their breast cancer right now and to significantly reduce the risk for an additional breast cancer in the future, or they might still plan to have a more minimal surgery, um, surgery like a lumpectomy, remove the tumor, but then with the knowledge that the remaining breast tissue needs to have some high risk screening in the future. So um, it's not just informative for people who have never had a cancer diagnosis. Okay, so that, that would circle back to why you said you like the cancer genetic counseling so much because you're able to give these people at least a, some kind of moving forward plan uh, rather than just the, the news that they might not wanna hear. Right, right, yeah. And I, I think that there are probably some people who, um, most people that end up coming to their counseling session end up testing. But I, I think that the people who truly would not want to know kind of self-select and maybe don't even make appointments with us. But part of why um, it's genetic counseling and not just genetic testing is that I do meet with people sometimes where we talk about these are the decisions you would need to make if you did have a positive test result. And sometimes people say, you know what? I would not change my care. I would never think about having a bilateral mastectomy. I just don't want to know this kind of thing. And then we say, that's okay. It's here if you ever want it. But that's why we kind of talk through the implications instead of just drawing your blood and sending it off and having you get this type of information without knowing in advance what it could mean for you. Okay, that's, that's really great that there are different options. I guess I didn't really consider that you could potentially, or that the patient could potentially opt out of that kind of thing, but it, it does totally make sense. And it's great that that option is at least there for them. Yeah. Um, one thing that you'll learn about is that one of the underlying philosophical principle, principles of genetic counseling is being non-directive. Um, so letting the patient know what testing could do for them, not just in cancer genetic counseling, but in other capacities, and then helping them evaluate whether or not it's right for them. But you don't personally um, push them to test or not test. And that's um, somewhat unique among medical professions. There are other providers that are like that as well, but um, many uh, areas of medicine are, are not quite um, influenced by that non-directive principle. That's really interesting. I didn't know that, but that, that yeah. totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's great. So on the flip side, I'm curious what the hardest part of your job is in your opinion. Yeah. 
Um, I think that you will probably get the same answer from all, if not like 90% of people you talk with, which is the American healthcare system. Um, so insurance specifically, it's just, it's ridiculous. Some of the restrictions that are placed on genetic testing. Um, I think that there is utility to having guidelines as to who we should prioritize for testing. Um, but historically speaking, insurance made it very difficult to get testing covered. Um, and I, I'm, I'm speaking only about cancer genetics because I've never worked in another specialty and I, I don't, I'm very uninformed on how insurance works in, in those scenarios. Um, but another thing that, to give some backstory. So prior to June, 2013, um, there was a lab called Myriad Genetics, and they had a patent on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Um, it's, a, it's a little more nuanced than that um, in terms of how the patent actually worked, but basically no one other than Myriad could test for these genes. And they are the two most common breast cancer genes, and to this day, they are the genes that the majority of the um, NCCN, the national, um, like, I always forget what that acronym stands for. It's National Cancer Comprehensive Network. Um, they set the standards for who should have genetic testing, and then most insurance companies follow those standards. They very recently expanded to include other genes beyond BRCA1 and 2, but they are still very BRCA-focused. Um, and for decades, from the early 1990s up until 2013, um, Myriad was the only lab that could do this testing, and you could only bill insurance for these genes most of the time. Um, there were a few other genetic conditions like leaf Raumini syndrome or familial adenomyosis polyposis or Lynch syndrome, where there were some criteria, but BRCA were really kind of the, the main ones we would think of. So... There was a Supreme Court case um, that ultimately overturned the patent that the labs had on those genes. Um, and within hours, other labs across the country were able to do testing. And the way they were able to be competitive was that they started offering not just BRCA1 and 2 analysis, but multi-gene panel analysis. And that was really the turning point. And the first time that it became easy to test for more than one gene and easier to bill insurance and for the cost of testing to drop because this one lab had previously held a monopoly. And if you have a bunch of other labs that now wanna offer testing, one way that they can be competitors with this giant of a lab is to offer cheaper testing. Um, so back when Myriad had the patent, if you couldn't get testing through your insurance, it cost about $4,000. And to this day, I have people who come in who had an aunt, grandma, something like that, who had breast cancer during this pre-Myriad um, versus the Association of Molecular Pathologists Supreme Court case. And they heard all these stories about it's thousands and thousands of dollars. They come to their appointment thinking it's gonna be thousands of dollars. And I'm able to say like, it's covered by your insurance or it's $250. Um, so it's gotten better, but cancer genetic testing certainly has this historical reputation of being incredibly expensive. And the insurance guidelines are still focused on um, BRCA1 and 2 testing alone. There are a lot of insurance companies that make it extremely difficult to order a multi-gene panel, even though there are dozens of medically actionable cancer genes that um, enable detection and prevention. And yeah, the worst part of my job is just figuring out, like, how do I get insurance to pay for this test that a person clearly needs to have? And the worst part is when you have a, a known mutation in the family, and that gene is just in a gene other than BRCA1 and 2. And if you have a person who is like a parent, child, or sibling of a known mutation carrier, they have a 50% chance to have that. And if it's in most genes other than BRCA1 and 2, you're not going to get it covered. Um, so that's a really frustrating experience, but I wouldn't be surprised if saying insurance is the worst part of my job is um, globally applicable to most healthcare providers and not just genetic counselors. So, yeah, I, yeah. I definitely have heard that before, um, but that is, that is very ridiculous. I can't believe that, but that was a really great history. I, I can't believe how much you know about that. That's very impressive. I, I think I only I know a lot about it because I have a manuscript that I submitted to a journal called Familial Cancer, where um, the in the introduction, I had to learn a lot about the history of that because the, the point of the research project 
was to retrospectively look at people who came back for multiple rounds of genetic testing and who had a very limited sort of genetic test on their first round and then had additional broader testing later. Um, so I, I know about that because I wrote a paper about it, but otherwise. Okay, well, I'm <laughs> <laughs> that is very interesting. Hopefully that gets better at some point, but. Yeah, so I'm waiting for the reviews to come back to know if they accepted my manuscript or not. So stay tuned. It's exciting. Do you know when you're yeah. expecting that? There's this um, useful but also anxiety producing feature on the website where you can track the progress of your manuscript and it has said reviews received for a while now and I don't know what the next step is. So yeah, stay tuned, unclear. It's academia takes a long time. That's what I've heard. That's very exciting <laughs> though. Hopefully that gets back soon. Thank you. They don't, don't they'll watch your YouTube hanging. video. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last question I had for you would be knowing what you know now as having gone through the graduate program and being a practicing counselor, what is some advice that you would give to your younger self when you were in my shoes, basically applying to grad school or just starting out in it? Yeah, I can think of a couple of things. Um, one that I mentioned already that is a lot more useful um, is to just get the guide to genetic counseling and read it. It's a textbook that you'll be able to understand the majority of it, even without like having a background. There's a lot of um, like technical things about molecular genetics that if you were just, I mean, I'll speak for myself. If I were reading a textbook by myself as a, a person fresh out of undergrad, I would have struggled to understand a lot of it. And it was helpful to have graduate school and professors to talk me through that. But like a first pass through the guide to genetic counseling is going to give you a massive amount of useful information. And when you have your interviews, you'll be able to know what you're talking about. You'll be able to talk about things like non-directiveness um, and just kind of like the general principles of counseling and testing. And then if there's anything that you don't understand, You'll, want to, you'll get it better when you're in our second pass in grad school and you have people to help you out. Um, the other thing that I remember being really focused on, and um, I, I've seen it in other prospective students too. So when people like you reach out to me, I always try to respond to them because so many people helped me uh, that I'm always trying to pay it forward. And the thing that I saw in myself that I see in other people who don't get in um, on the first try is being focused on getting into school. Um, and it's hard, right? Because you have this goal, you have something you wanna do and you can't do any of it unless you get into school. But just like make sure that you really, really care about it and that you want to help people and that you are able to be a compassionate and empathetic person and get some of those experiences with advocacy and volunteering and working with people who are having a hard time because if you don't like that, you're like, you can get into school, but you're not gonna like the job and the degree that you ultimately pay for. So um, it's easy for me to say, don't worry about getting into school, right? Cause I'm like five years out of school, but make sure that you care about it. Make sure that you like the experiences that are going to make you a competitive candidate um, and try to be focused on developing things that will make you a good genetic counselor instead of only like thinking about it as being like, I need to get into school thing. Um, it'll be obvious when you're interviewing if you know what you're talking about and if you care versus if you're just trying to like find something to do after undergrad. Um, I don't think that someone like you who's, who goes out of their way to interview people is going to have that problem, but um, I think it's hard during COVID to right to say that getting like direct experience with people is the best way to go. Um, I think we're toward hopefully the tail end and that and that type of thing will be easier. Um, and I would also say that it is incredibly common to not get in on your first try. Um, I think it now with um, do you know about the match system? Do you know about the changes to how people have gotten into genetic counseling over time? Um not the changes, I don't think. Yeah, so it used to be that um, there was a universal day where you would, you would go to programs, you would interview, and then all on the same day, 
you would get phone calls from schools that either said we're offering you a position or you're waitlisted or you've been declined. And you used to be able to sit on multiple offers from schools. There was like a three day period between like when you got all the calls and when everybody had to decide. Um, and now they've switched to a match system that is very much like a medical school system where after you interview, you rank all of the schools that you interviewed, they rank all of the people they interviewed, and then there's an algorithm that matches, like kind of zips everybody up. So you don't have the same control to pick what school you get to go to. Um, and I think that that has, mm, that's another pros and cons type thing. Um, and I think that the volume of people who are interested in genetic counseling has just skyrocketed over time. Um, and there are more programs um, and there are, and programs are taking more students. But I, I think that like, if this is like the interest level in genetic counseling and prospective applicants, and like, this is like, there used to be a couple dozen schools and it's like, it's just not growing at the same rate as the interest. So it's really, really competitive. Um, I beat myself up a lot when I didn't get in on the first try. And then later when I was, you know, a person who was reviewing applications for programs, I saw how many people were repeat applicants and I saw how much better they did over time. And just, it's okay. It's such a competitive field and such a small field that, um, you know, until the, the number of schools and programs and slots catches up with the interest, um, there are gonna be a lot of people who don't get in and, as long as you try to improve, if you reach out to programs that rejected you and ask like, what happened? What can I improve? They'll be honest and kind with you. And there are all kinds of things that you can do. Like I um, I had a woman who, um, she didn't have any in-person experience. She had decided, um, you know, uh, shortly before COVID that she was interested in being a genetic counselor. And she just went all out on every online experience that she could possibly get all kinds of webinars and joining the National Society of Genetic Counselors and, you know, everything that she could do. And she got in on her first try. It was amazing. <laughs> so um, there's, it's, it's competitive, but see what's available to you try to immerse yourself as much as you can. Like it's really easy, everybody's on their phone all the time. It's really easy to do things like follow the National Society of Genetic Counselors, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, um, NIH's genetic branch, and just like see these things and get updates on what's going on in the genetics world on a daily basis. And it'll give you stuff to talk about when you're in interviews, it'll show that you care, that you're up on what's going on. Um, and just making it a part of your life because it'll be a part of your life if it's your job someday. So. And don't That's be afraid to ask advice. for help. Yeah, thank you. I, re I really appreciate that. I've definitely never heard the tip about reading that book. I'm going to look into that though, because that sounds like a phenomenal idea. And I also really love what you said about making sure you want to do it because it seems kind of obvious, but I've definitely been trying as I've been getting into some more experiences lately. Like I just started... I finally got through the training and the application process of a crisis text line. And I've been doing it for like a little over a week as far as the actually starting shifts. And I really do, I've already felt so much um, fulfillment from doing it, which I'm really happy about because it is another confirmation that I think I'm doing the right thing and talking yeah. to you and the other counselors I've gotten to speak to so far, it makes me really excited and continues to reaffirm that. So um, I'm, I think that is great advice and I'm, glad that I can kind of see that happening already. Good. You're on the right track. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think that's all I have for you right now, but you've been a wealth of knowledge today. Um, <laughs> that has been super helpful and I really do appreciate your, your time today. Sure, keep in touch if there's anything I can do to help you. You have my email. All right, we'll do. Have a great rest of your day and weekend. Thanks, you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, so that was Shannon Detweiler. Uh, one more genetic counselor interview for you guys. So stay posted. More are going to be coming out in the coming weeks and days, hopefully. So stay posted and we'll keep that content coming for you. Have a good one.